lockdown, I taught myself the accordion and I'd quite like to learn how to yodel. It was all like kind of supermodels with chihuahuas and then me and Daisy and all the chihuahuas were just exemplary and Daisy just shat everywhere and bit everyone. Awful. How do you find narrating the audiobooks? They bribe me with regular uh, offerings from Pret-a-Manger. Combination of a vicar and Radio 4 makes a lot of people just sort of go, oh, <laughs> wasn't he nice? So, Richard, thank Hello. you so much for joining me. Thank you. Um, we're here to chat about your new book, yeah. A Death in the Parish. How would you um, sum up, obviously, without giving anything away, the plot of this second uh, Canon Clement mystery book? Well, Sleepy Champs and St Mary, which has been so disrupted just a few months before with uh, an outburst of murder, uh, seems to have settled back into a normal pattern, except there's one difference, because Daniel now has a colleague. There's been a pastoral reorganisation and he has um, a new colleague bundled in with the parishes of Upper and Lower Bad Saddle. And that colleague comes from a different tradition within the Church of England's rich rain, uh, range of traditions. So there's um, a thing about them getting used to each other or trying to understand each other. And that's all sort of proceeding along in a vaguely sort of English pastoral, clerical, comic sort of way. And then a body is discovered and all of a sudden it's all upside down again and they have to work out who, why, and when. There's also quite a lot of animal action in this book. Mm -hmm. So d tell me why you love a, a Dachshund or a Dachshund? Dachshund so much. Be Dachshund so much. It. Well, I've always loved them. So I had one, well, my family, we had one when I was a little boy, and I think I've had 13 altogether now. I'm on my last two, who are very ancient and grumpy. But they're feisty, they're funny, they're incredibly disloyal. They're unbelievably annoying. They shit everywhere. The only thing which has ever made... I've got a Dachshund called Daisy. And she, she's always just done what the hell she wants, really. She's been to puppy classes. We went to puppy classes in Belgravia, the poshest puppy classes in all London. And it was all, like, kind of supermodels with chihuahuas and then me and Daisy. And all the chihuahuas were just exemplary and Daisy just shat everywhere and bit everyone. Awful. But... We did find the one thing that worked for her was taramasalata. <laughs> I absentmindedly put an emptied tub down on a tabletop. She got on the tabletop and then discovered it, and she just went into this... It was almost like a seizure of delight at the taramasalata. So I now know the one thing that will actually get her attention for a second is the promise of smoked fish roe. <laughs> Great, love it. Um, you and your character, Daniel, I, I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear me say, do seem to have some similarities. He's really not me at all, apart from the fact that we, well, we're vicars, we have Dachshunds, and if there is one person in the books who bears a passing resemblance to in reality, his mother and my mother would look <laughs> quite alike, I think. No, I wasn't interested in writing about someone like me. I wanted to write about someone who was more buttoned up than me, mm -hmm. and also someone who was more diligent than me, and also, I think, karma. Mm. There's a sort of calmness about him and a peacefulness about him, which I like. And I want to try to disrupt that a bit, really, because it's related to his buttoned upness, and I want him to unbutton a bit. Do you feel like you are quite different to what you put out there? Yeah. A combination of a vicar and Radio 4 makes a lot of people just sort of go, oh, <laughs> oh, oh isn't he nice? And I'm not, actually. I'm, a, you know, a real person like anybody else, and I have light and shade and all that stuff. And sometimes I try to sort of just put a bit more of a truthful version of me out there with some of that um, less appealing stuff showing. And they're sort of going, oh, it's weird. It doesn't right. it I sometimes doesn't hit. think, what would I have to do? I don't know, slap a child or something. <laughs> Maybe don't. No. no. But, you know, <laughs> but, but it, it, there is this, the version of you that's in their head yeah. is not you. Mm. And the two vicars in the book that have very kind of uh, opposing views, different ways of going about things, yeah. um, what was the inspiration for, for that kind of, um, I guess, conflict? Well, it's a very real thing. So I I'm, belong to the tradition which Daniel belongs to, too, which is the sort of high church tradition. And like lots of people, we work alongside people who are in the opposite, the low church tradition. Most of the time it's absolutely fine. And and. Literally some of my best friends are in that tradition. But sometimes those relationships can go very wrong. And uh, 
it always makes me laugh at that. You know, you you think that two people, both vicars in the Church of England, would essentially be on the same page, right? But they're absolutely not. There's a thing that Freud called the narcissism of small difference, which I really like. This idea that it's you're more likely to fall out with your brother than a stranger because small differences are more intense somehow. Mm. And it's very like that with clergy. What's the difference between the high and the low? Gosh, so hard to... <laughs> well, the high church tradition really uh, feel, would feel much more like a Catholic world. So um, smells and bells and mystery and dressing up and lovely liturgy and that kind of thing. The low church tradition is much more about the Bible, so it's very scriptural, don't like dressing up, long sermons, and um, also happy clappy. So... Chris, the vicar, who the Daniel's colleague, is in that happy clappy sort of tradition, and Daniel is in the fuddy duddy sort of tradition. So they just don't really understand. I mean, Daniel even struggles with muesli, let alone, you know, happy clappy. <laughs> and what was your inspiration for creating the the setting, the the sense of place, the the the, the village itself? Where I grew up, really. So I grew up in rural Northamptonshire, and I grew up in. And lived for many years in a village which is very like Champton St Mary. It's an estate village on a big estate. And it looks, it's very pretty, and it looks like nothing much has changed there since, I don't know, the Civil War or something. But one of the things, people used to think, oh, that my life as a country parson was basically church fates and, you know, even song. And it was all that. But in my first week, we had a murder. And it wasn't the only one. And, you know, Stuff happens everywhere, doesn't it? I mean, somebody was cross with me for writing crime fiction that wasn't set in the mean streets of a rough old city because that's real and somehow, you know, vicarages and English villages aren't real. And I said, well, actually, they are real to mm. me. That's, that, that's where I live. That's what I do. So the fact that it, um, it plays into some very sort of enduring tropes in English literature of the pastoral and the kind of vicar and that kind of thing, um, it is... Real life is lived in places like that. Do you still spend a lot of time kind of in churches and things like that? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, um, I, do, I do what I have to do, but uh, I'm enjoying actually not... When you stop doing something that you've done for a while, especially if it's something that has shaped your identity so much, it's actually a good idea, I think, to sniff the air outside. In lockdown, I taught myself the accordion, and I'd quite like to learn how to yodel. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've we've touched on a, a, a few different plot points and, and characters in this book. How do you find narrating the audiobooks? Well, I quite I go into a sort of thing really. Um, they bribe me with regular uh, offerings from Pret a Manger, so I know that if I get to the end of chapter two, then I can have a jambon de beurre, which I like very much. So I'm easily bribed with food, and that happens. It, I mean, nothing exposes the flaws of your prose more than reading it out loud. So now I've got the habit of reading out loud when I've finished a, a thing mm. and then listening to it back, actually. Um, it has slightly changed the way some of the characters, their origin has got a bit mysterious because of the limited number of accents I can do. <laughs> so I, I, I have to risk the temptation to turn some people into Georges because I can... Do a little bit of Geordie, no. <laughs> what character have you most enjoyed embodying? Neil. Okay. How does Neil sound? He's from Manchester. Well, he's actually from Oldham, so he's a bit like that, really. Eccles, in fact, he's from, so he's a bit like that, but not very like that. But he's not in, he's not, oh, an oasis, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's sort of like that. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you so much for a, a really interesting chat, and I wish you the best of luck um, with the yodelling when, whenever you get there. <laughs> I'll come on and yodel for you if you like. Yes, please. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Ollie. Nice to talk to you. <laughs>